Welcome to Discovery Church. We're beginning this brand new series that I'm really, I'm so excited about. We've called it Postured. Uh, I believe that God is, is doing something, and there is a season that we're entering into that of preparedness, of readiness, that there is a posture, check it out, there is a posture of our lives that when we get aligned right, God is attracted to it. Posture is, there's another word for posture is alignment. And in this season, there is a realignment. Some of you, this is like, this is like you know that there are some things that got out of alignment. And there may be some things that have been out of alignment for a long time in your life. And God is so, hear me please, I'm speaking this prophetically. He is ready to move in your life. You just need to get ready. You just need to get aligned. You just need to get in the right posture. And when we do, there are certain postures of your life that God is actually attracted to, that his presence is attracted to. Uh, to. So here's the scripture, 2 Chronicles chapter 7 is our theme verse for the entire series, um, this four-week series we're doing. Let me give you a little context of 2 Chronicles chapter 7, though, because in, in this timeline of the verse, the Israelites just finished building the temple. And so they were on like a, a high. They were like, everything was going good, milk and honey, success, favor of God. But then right before this, this verse, God says, if there ever comes a moment where I shut the heavens of rain and the crops don't yield the fruit that you think it should yield, if there ever, if there ever, because you're postured right, right now and things are happening right, but if you ever get out of alignment and if you ever get out of the wrong posture going on and I, and I shut the heavens and the crops don't do what they need to do, there is, there is a response that you can have and I'll be ready. This is what he says. If my, if my people, my God define people. I love that. Do you know that you as God's people have a role to play in how God moves on the earth? Amen, somebody that you guys have, you have a role to play in the health of our city. God has given you authority that, that the church, if his people, his God defined people, we, we have a role to play in the health of our homes and the health of our city and the health of our nation. He has entrusted to us, my people, my God defined people. If they respond by, here's the four things we're going to study. If they respond by humbling themselves, praying, seeking my presence, and turning their backs on their lives, here's what God says. Check it out. I'll be there ready for you. God says, God says I'm already ready. I'm just waiting on you. I'm, I'm already on the other end of the breakthrough. God is saying, I'm, I'm already on the other end of the solution, on the other end of the answer, on the other end of the season, and I'm just waiting on you. I'm ready. As soon as you get into alignment, as soon as you get this posture, I've been ready, God is saying. I've been ready. Just get into alignment, and you'll see me move in your life. Amen? He says, I'll be there ready for you. And here's what I'll do. He says, I'll listen from heaven, forgive their sins, restore health to their land. So there is a posture that you and I can have that we're entering into a season. We're going to realign some things. That God says, when you align right, when you get in the right posture, he brings forgiveness, restoration, and healing. So the first the first posture we're going to study today is the posture of prayer. The posture of prayer. And every August, uh, if you're new here on Discovery, every August we begin um, a 21-day period of prayer. It really is for us a time of realignment. But honestly, it's, it's, even, it's more than that. The reason why we have a 21-day prayer is because God has called us to do some things that we can't do by ourselves. Listen, God has put a destiny on our life. He has given us an assignment that is beyond human ability, human attainment. When I look at my life and what God has called me to do, and I look at the future of what God has called me to do, his destiny for my life, it causes me to hit my knees. I say, God, I need you. Why do we pray? Because we need God. We need, we need God. That's why we do, we do the 21 days of prayer. But every time any pastor, communicator, anyone, anytime I talk about prayer, there's always the tension in the room because it's kind of the thing that you know you should do more. And, and if I don't approach this topic right, so let me call it out, it's something that you can feel guilty about. So I just want to call it out because like 10% of people, I found that only about 10% of people actually enjoy praying. Um, and I think it has a lot to do with, with our mindset, perspective about what prayer is and what it's not. Um, well, a lot of people are just uncomfortable praying. They, they have a wrong perspective or they're uncomfortable about, about prayer. But hey, what, what if prayer was something that you were so comfortable and, and, and you did so well 
that, that it was so fruitful for your life that you couldn't stop praying. Like you could, it, it, you just wanted to pray. And that's what I'd like to hopefully shift today because this is a posture that God says, if you just, if you would just pray, then I will respond from heaven. And there are prayers, I'm going I'm to teach you today the kind of prayers that, that gets God's response. The kind of posture you can align yourself that are, that's effective and gets the response of heaven. Now, to be honest though, I never like praying. I don't know if you've ever been there, or maybe you're there today. Maybe, maybe you're uncomfortable. I was uncomfortable. Didn't like it. Didn't have a good perspective about it, because I was just, I, I had some bad prayer experiences, too. Maybe you've had some bad prayer experiences, where you, someone called on you to pray. You know, have you ever done that? Hey, why don't you pray? You're like, oh, freeze up, choke up time. Or I, literally, this happened to me. That's happened to me, but this has happened to me, too, where, where I found myself in a prayer circle that I didn't know we were doing. All of a sudden, everybody grabbed their hands. It's like, oh, this is what we're doing? Oh. We're all hands, okay? And, and we're praying, but then all of a sudden, after that person prays, the next person prays, and the next person prays. And I'm like, oh, God, okay, oh, this is what we're doing. I didn't sign up for this. We're going around now. Okay, now I'm thinking, like, what am I going to say? What am I going to say? What am I going to say? I'm just trying to rehearse what I'm going to say in my, in my mind. And sure enough, I kid you not, the person next to me says what I was going to say. <laughs> Palms sweating and stuff, and so... So, or, or maybe the, it, the nursery rhyme prayer, maybe that was something that you knew. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. What kind of morbid fool made that up? You know what I mean? Telling your kids, what are you, and, and if I die before I wake, you know, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Good night, sweetie. Have sweet dreams. <laughs> so, are you kidding me? So I think our perspective about prayer and our comfort level needs to change. And hopefully those are some things that are going to shift today because it is a posture that we need to get into for God to respond and move on in our life. You guys, here's, here's the big idea of the message today. Prayer should be our first response, not our last resort. So for a, for a lot of us, many of us, okay, prayer is our last resort. It's the Hail Mary. It's the, uh, the fire alarm is going off. It's the 911, help, I, I made a mess of it. Now I need you to clean it up. God kind of thing. That's what it is. But what would it look like if, if and here's the rally, chi of, rally cry of Discovery Church, what would it look like if it, in everything we did, we just prayed first? We just, we just prayed first. So before you got out of your bed in the morning, well, I'm not talking about an hour-long prayer, nothing eloquent or poetic or sounds lofty. I'm talking about one sentence. What if you just took one sentence and invited God into your day? God, help me in this day to live for you. What if you just, you just one, what if before you sent your kids off to school, you prayed first? You say, oh, hey, before you go, hey, God bless them. Help them to be leaders, not followers. Help them to serve you and live for you today in Jesus' name. What if you just brought, what if before you answered that phone call, you, say it. Hey, it's not rocket science. It's two words, guys. Help me out, okay? What if before you took that call, you what? What if before you answered that text, you what? What if before you so posted that social media post, you what? Pray. Come on, what if you just prayed first before everything you do, you invited God into that decision, into your life? This is the way Paul said it in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. He said in verse 16, it's just two words, rejoice always. And then verse 17 is another two words, pray continually. Now what does that mean? Am I supposed to just be talking to God all day? Man, I just know it. Who could ever, I can't do that. That's not what he means. What he's saying is, Bring God into every situation throughout your day. So whatever decision you're making or before you make it, before you do it, before you say it, before that meeting you go into, God, help me with this meeting. Give me wisdom to make decisions that are God-honoring. Before you go shopping for your kids back to school, God, help me not to do it again, not to, not to break the bank again, okay? To, giving your kids everything you didn't get, all right, and getting into debt for that. Come on, man. Give me hand, hand me downs are okay, all right? They are okay. What if you just pray what if you just prayed first? That's what he means by pray continually. It isn't just like come just talk 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 all day. It means bring God into every situation. He says give thanks in all circumstances for this is God's will for you. Like if you ever wonder what God's will for your life is, man, I wonder what God's will for my life is. This is it. God wants you to rejoice always like he wants a praise to be in your heart and on your lips he wants you to constantly bring him into every situation of your life in prayer and then he wants you to be thankful to him this is god's will for you in christ jesus that's what his will is 
the New Living Translation says it like this. Never stop praying. Never stop praying. I love what uh, this quote by Smith Wigglesworth, he's a uh, revivalist. He says it like this. I would never pray more than 20 minutes. Someone say amen to that. All right, it doesn't have to be long to be divine. It doesn't. He, this is a revivalist. This guy was an on fire for God, made a huge impact on the world and on the church. I'd never pray more than 20 minutes, but I never go more than 20 minutes without praying. What an amazing thought, right? It's, it's not like how long I pray. It's actually how, how much I include God in every decision as part of my life. I'm just including. Jesus said it this way in Luke 18. He said, one day Jesus told his disciples a story to show that they should always pray and never give up. So what I want to do, what I want to do today, I want to show you why prayer is something that you can't live without. Like Martin Luther said that um, just as air is to living, prayer is to the Christian. Like, like it is the air that you breathe, you guys, and I hope that you see it differently today. So I want to show you why it's something that we absolutely need. And then when, when we pray first and we put God into every situation, what that actually shows what it's telling God when we do that. And then I want to get really practical today, really practical. I want to give you a very fresh perspective on how to look at your, your prayer life and, and really help you with the kind of prayers that are actually effective, that God responds to. So check it out. Here's, here's what happens. When we pray first, it shows something. Write them down. Number one, it shows I'm depending on God. How many of you know you need God here, okay? Or do you know that you need God? Needing God and depending on God does not mean that you're weak. It's, a, it's not acknowledging your weakness. It's acknowledging his strength. That's what that is. I, I, I know I need God. And if, we're on, if you guys are honest, listen, the reason why we don't pray first is because we think we can do it by ourselves. We think we can handle it. We got this. We'll take care of this. So when there's a problem or a challenge or a situation we're going through, the natural human inclination is to go, oh, what do I need to do to fix this? What do I need to do? Instead of going, God, what do you want me to do? It's just not natural. You see, this, this pr praying is a conscious effort and a choice to include God into every situation that you're in. It's an effort. John 15 and 4, I showed you guys this verse. Here's another translation. I showed it to you last week. And Jesus says, abide in me, to, to remain, to abide in me. And you, like, it, today what is very prevalent is cultural Christianity. Not like, the, God never intended for you to be just a, a, he never intended for him to be your Sunday God. He always meant for, for, for you to abide in him, to remain in him. And so how do we do that? By bringing him into every situation by praying continually, by just, by, by letting them into every decision, every, that's how we abide in Christ. He says, abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. Um, that's what authentic Christianity is. That's, it's, it's this day-by-day -day continual involvement of God in your life, not just on one day of the week, not this cultural Christianity. I think that for a lot of people, we have, we have spiritual places, places that we can be spiritual, places that we are aligned. Like we have, we have places like, man, where I'm aligned, I'm postured right, I'm hearing from God. I can even make good decisions when I'm in my spiritual place. And I feel good and I feel right in my spiritual place, but I have a hard problem getting that place into the rest of my places. And that's what it is to abide, to remain in. Because a branch that is disconnected, if it's only connected one day a week and disconnects, it cannot produce fruit. And some of you know what I'm talking about. You're like a, because I've been there, you're like a branch. Like me, I used to be a branch, trying really hard, struggling. And all you're doing is popping out leaves. Leaf, nothing. No fruit. You can't produce fruit apart from the vine. You're just struggling, you're trying, but no fruit of the Spirit is coming. Nothing lasting, nothing impacting, just leaves. And some of you here today, and you're tired of producing leaves. And you need to get connected to the vine. You need, you need to abide in him. I love Psalm 62 in the, in the Good News Translation. It says, I depend on God alone. I don't depend on my intellect, my knowledge. I don't depend on my strength. I depend on God alone. I put my hope in him. He alone protects me and saves me. He is my defender, and I shall never be defeated. I'm telling you, there is nothing God will not do for the person who is fully dependent upon him. 
See, I, that my, my usefulness as a leader, and honestly, your usefulness as a child of God, you guys, it starts with acknowledging your dependence upon God. And that's what prayer does. Praying first acknowledges I'm dependent upon God. Here's the second thing it also does. It lightens my load. It lightens my, my load. So life is stressful. Life is tough. It can be. It doesn't matter how Christian you are, how good you are. Life is just going to be tough. Life can be very, very stressful on us. There was actually a, a, a study. You guys probably know this, but there was a, a university did a, did a study, and they said that stress affects three areas, your mood, your body, and your behavior. So you guys have probably seen this in your own life. Like it can produce anxiety, depression, sleep disorders, headaches, panic attacks, fatigue, even chest pain. It can even, stress can lead to like drug abuse, alcohol abuse, chemical abuse, all that kind of stuff. This university, the University of Wisconsin, did this study on stress. And they actually proved that prayer is one of the best and most effective uh, um, against, uh, against stress. That is, it, it is, it is one of the best uses uh, to fight stress. And, and science and academia is only catching up to and catching on to what God has said from the very beginning, you guys. For thousands of years, God has told us this. Look at Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. They that wait upon the Lord shall what? Renew their strength. See, your, your strength is a diminishing commodity. Okay, you don't have, you don't have, strength upon strength, all right? You have only a certain amount of strength. Your peace is a diminishing commodity. Your patience is a diminishing commodity. Your self-control is a diminishing commodity. I don't care how strong you are, how long you've been a Christian. If you get tempted enough, 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 you're going to fall. You're, you only have so much. If, you, if your strength is use, 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 you're going to run out of strength. If your patience gets tested enough and enough and enough, you're going to snap eventually. It doesn't matter how big of a Christian you are, how good you are. It's a diminishing quantity. Where, 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 where do I get that, that re- more patience? Where do I get more peace? Where do I get more self-control? Where do I get more strength? Those that wait upon the Lord shall renew all that dimish, diminishing commodity that I'm expensing every day. Shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint, the Bible says. See, life is going to produce stress. It's going to. And, and, and prayer allows us to lighten our load. It's, it's stressful. Prayer does that. That's what it shows. It, it'll, it'll lighten our load. Here's the third thing that it'll do. It releases God's power. How many of you want God's power in your life? All right, church, you want God's power? There is nothing that releases the power of God more than the prayer of faith. See, prayer, prayer can do anything that God can do. Amen, you guys. Pray, pray. The prayer of faith can do, it actually is the access point to God's power, to God's resources. Prayer accesses everything that God has for you. Jeremiah 33, verse 3. Actually, the verses before this says, you know, when you call to me, he says, uh, when, when you pursue me, you got to pursue me with your whole heart. If you pursue me with your whole heart, uh, you can, I'll, I'll be found by you. And then he says, then you can call to me and I will answer you and I'll, sh- I'll show you great and mighty things that you don't even know right now. You can't even see it right now. Right now. I will show you those things. When you bring God with prayer, when you bring God in that situation, the, that project, that problem, that challenge, when you bring him into the impossible situation, it immediately becomes possible. With God, all things are possible. So, so pray first. Absolutely. We, we, we pray first, but People always ask, I get asked this a lot about prayer. Like, how do you pray? Well, I don't know how to pray. I'm not good at prayer, someone will say. I don't feel comfortable praying. And it's just the perspective, I think, that we have about prayer that is, that is making us ineffective. Because it's not supposed to be poetry. It's not supposed to be eloquent. It doesn't even need to be long. All it is, hear me, you guys, is revealing your heart to God. It's sharing your heart to God. That's, that's what prayer is. So Jesus took it a step further. He didn't just say, hey, pray. But this is what I want to teach you because he told us to do something while we pray. Okay, check it out. Matthew 26, 41. He says, watch and pray. So don't just pray. Yeah, pray first, pray. But what are you focused on while you're praying? What has your attention? What are you looking at while you're praying? Because when you watch and pray, then, he says, you won't fall into sin when you're tempted. The spirit is willing, but the flesh 
is weak. So here, it's not in your notes, but here's what I want you to understand is that your focus, your focus actually affects your posture. What you're focusing on will affect your, see, we're focused on the wrong thing sometimes, and we're, we're walking around with our head down, looking at the challenge, looking at the problem, looking at your crisis, and it's got your posture messed up. Your focus affects your posture. When I went into the chiropractic years ago for my back, one of the things they wanted to see my alignment, so he had a point on the wall that he actually said, focus on that. And as you focus on that, your, your, your posture follows your focus. My focus affects my posture. So here's the question, what are you looking at? Hey, pray. Let's pray. Pray first. But what are you looking at? What do you focus on while you're praying? And I want to submit to you that there are five directions that you need to be looking at in prayer. And, and this is the kind of prayer that is powerful, that is effective, that it, that'll put you in the right posture that God responds to. There are five directions. You may even call them dimensions, if you will, the five directions or the five dimensions of prayer. And I'll give them to you, and then I'll give them to you again. It's backward, upward, inward, outward, and forward. Backward, upward, inward, outward, and forward. Let me, let, me, let me explain. All right, here, write some notes with me. Here's the first direction that I need to look as I watch and pray. Number one, I need to look backward toward the cross. See, some of us, we, we don't like prayer, and it's hard for us even to enter prayer because we have so much guilt, so much shame and frustration because we're not looking back at the cross. We're looking back at our past. We're looking back at our sin. And so, so it when you look back at the cross, now I, I, I put my challenge and my crisis in the context of the cross. And because of the cross, I am forgiven, I am redeemed, I am justified, I am free. And that's the first direction that I need to look. I need to put whatever I'm going through, whatever pain, whatever hurt, whatever challenge, it needs to be brought into the context of the cross of Jesus Christ. That's the first direction. And not only does that does that give me the context of what is available to me now because of the cross? But it also makes me, it like fills me with gratitude. I am so grateful. I am so, it fills me now with thankfulness that now instead of coming to God, the first thing we do is complain. God, why this and why that? And God, I need this. And this is what we, this is what, when you look to the cross, not only do you stand justified, redeemed, forgiven, fully loved, but now I'm postured not with criticism and complaints, but thankfulness and gratitude. Thank you, Jesus, for what you did for me, what you paid for me. First Peter chapter one says it like this, that God paid a ransom to save you from an empty life. And that's what we had. Our life was empty without him. But there was a ransom. There was a cross that had to be bore for our sin, for our shame, and for our guilt. So we don't have to enter into God's presence like that. He paid for you with the precious lifeblood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God, the Bible says. So whatever you're facing today, whatever you're facing, whatever that thing is or that challenge is, the first direction that I need to look to posture my, to have the posture of prayer, the first direction is looking back to the cross. Bring whatever that challenge is into the context of the cross of Christ. That's the first direction. I look backward. Here's the second direction. I look upward to my Father. So not only am I looking backward, but now I'm looking the second direction. God wants you to focus on is who God is. And God does not want you to think of him as a dictator, as a boss, as a supervisor, as a coach. When, when Jesus taught us how to pray in the scriptures, and he was asked, and Jesus taught us how to, he said, pray like this, our Father who art in heaven. And that was a, it, it's not radical to us, but I promise you, when Jesus told his disciples that, that was a radical statement. Because in the Old Testament, nobody called God Father. That's an earthly term. You don't call God an earthly term. That in the Old Testament, they call God all kinds of things like majestic and king of kings and lord of lords and creator and a bunch of big titles and words is what they gave God. But never Father, Father no, and some of us are uncomfortable with even calling him father because maybe you had a bad earthly father. And what you need to know is that God is not your father and your father isn't God. Our, our, our God is a good father. He is a perfect father. He is, he is compassionate and considerate and caring. All other fathers, myself included, fail. We are not perfect, but our God is perfect and he loves us perfectly. See, the way that we see God will control your life more than anything else in your life. The way that you see God will, will determine 
if your prayers are fruitful and fulfilling or not. Romans chapter 8, 15 through 17 says this, that you should not act like cowering, fearful slaves. That's not who you are. We sang a song about that just this morning, right? That we are no longer slaves to fear. God doesn't want you coming to his presence where you're going, oh, am I going to get beat up? God's mad at me. I'm going to get a spanking. God doesn't want you, don't do you cowardly entering his presence like you're afraid of him, like you're some kind of slave. No, since God's spirit has adopted you as children into God's family. See, you're not a slave. You're a son. You're a daughter of God. Instead, by his uh, spirit, we simply cry out, Abba, Father. And then he says, and God's spirit affirms that we really are his children. And since we're now God's child, look at this, we're also heirs. We get to share in the inheritance of Jesus, both his suffering and his glory. We get to share in it all. See, there's three ways that God wants your prayers to be. And again, if you want your prayers to be powerful and effective and postured right where God responds, three things we learn from Romans chapter 8 here. It's not in your notes. You may want to write them down. But the first thing is that God wants your prayers personal. He, he, he doesn't need eloquence. He doesn't need poetry. He does, sure doesn't need King James. Please stop it, okay? It's just as he says, he says, I want you to call me Abba. Father. Abba is an Aramaic word. It's an Aramaic term. That's the language that they were speaking in Jesus' day. If you go to the Middle East today, um, in, in a town in the Middle East, you might see a kid running the street crying, Abba, 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 still today. And you know what it means? It means daddy, dada, papa. It, it is a, a personal, intimate, endearing term. God, listen, God wanted you to call him. God wants you to know, yes, he's king. Yes, he's Lord. Yes, he's sovereign. He's creator. He's all those things. But he wants to be known by you and have a relationship with you in such a way that you would call him daddy. Dada, papa. And some of you say, well, that feels uncomfortable. I can't call him that. Yeah, that's why your prayers suck. <laughs> Y'all need to get over it. Get over it. And, and, and get intimate with God. He wants to be your personal father, your Abba, your dad. And if you can't see him that way, that's the problem, you guys, that he wants it to be. He wants you to have a personal relationship with him. So secondly, not only personal, he wants your prayers to be passionate. He said, he said cry out, Abba, Father. So God just doesn't, he doesn't want to just hear your words. He wants to hear your heart. How do you say God doesn't care as much about your words and what you're saying and how you're saying it as much as he cares about your heart. God wants to see your heart cry out. I mean, put some passion into your prayer. Put some heart into your prayer. He wants to see it. He wants to see your heart. Show him your heart, not just your words. And then personal, passionate. And then the third thing is a partnership. That prayer was always meant to be a partnership with God. This may surprise some of you. But um, did you know that when you're praying, God is actually praying for you to himself on your behalf? I know that's confusing. Let me just give you the scripture. Romans chapter 8, <laughs> verse 26. It says, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. Because we don't know what we ought to pray for. You ever been there? You don't know what to pray for? Sometimes we think we even know what to pray for, and we don't know what to pray for. But thank God, because the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans, the Bible says. Like, like the Holy Spirit is interceding on my behalf, which leads me to the third direction. Not only backward to the cross, upward to the Father. But number three, the third direction is I need to look inward to the Holy Spirit living in me. Uh, when you gave your life to Christ and, and, and he saved you, redeemed you, set you free, at that moment, the Holy Spirit made your heart his home. You are, the Bible says, a temple of the Holy Spirit. He is living. You, you are the dwelling place of God's Spirit. You host the presence of God. He's in there. But the problem is he's in there with a lot of other stuff. There's a lot of other stuff in there sharing room with God, with the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 8, verse 9 says it like this, that you, however, are not the, in the realm of of the flesh. You may exist in this world, but don't get caught up in the realm of the flesh. He says, no, you have a spirit, man. You have, you've been awakened in your spirit. You live in the realm of the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God lives in you. 
And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. So, so God makes, the Holy Spirit makes your uh, heart his home. He indwells you. But, but there's also, once we turn our prayers and we look inward, we, we find that there's also some other things in there that shouldn't be in there. There's some fears that are in there that shouldn't be in there. There's some unforgiveness in there. There's some, there's some uh, uh, secret even sins that might be in there. There's bad attitudes. There's hurtful emotions. There's, there's all kind of stuff. And we go, God, I, I, I don't even know how to start. Where do I start with all this stuff that's in there with you? How do I get rid? Do, God, help me do some house cleaning inside my life. That's the inward prayer. That's the third direction, the posture that we need to we need to posture ourselves in prayer. Second Corinthians says it like this, that we need to examine ourselves, that there is an examination that we need to take, examine to see if your faith is real and growing. God, help me, search me. See, see if my faith is real, if it's grown, if there's anything in there that needs to be brought out because I don't know sometimes what to pray for. I don't even know what's hiding in there sometimes. And see, a lot of us, we're, we might skip this this part of, of prayer to our own detriment because we don't want the light to shine in that area. We don't want to, because the truth will set you free, but the truth makes you miserable at first, doesn't it? Because the truth I like the least is the truth about me. And the truth you like the least is the truth about you. That truth that we look in the mirror and we see ourselves for, for who we really are. The truth will set you free, but it often makes you miserable at first. And some of us have skipped this direction, this, this, this posture of prayer where we look inward because there are secret things, hidden things, unforgiveness that's there. We don't want to let it go yet. We don't, we don't want to let that go. We don't want to let them off the hook. We feel justified in it. And so we don't, we skip this step. And the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 28, it says that if you try to hide your sins, you, you'll never be successful. And maybe that's why things aren't working. Like, things aren't working. Why am I not? Like, why can't this work out for me? Well, maybe I'm skipping a step here. Maybe I'm not allowing the Holy Spirit to test me, to examine me, to see if my faith is real and it's growing. It's the third direction you and I need to be looking into in prayer. Not only at the cross and to the Father, but I need to look in and say, Holy Spirit, help me. Because if I hide that stuff, I'll never succeed. But if you humbly confess and reject them, you, he says, you'll get another chance. You will find Mercy is what the Bible says. And here's the big secret. <laughs> the big secret is this. God already knows what's in there. It ain't a surprise to God. You're not going to confess up to God and him go, <gasps> you did? That's not going to happen. No, God's never going to gasp at what you, <laughs> he already knows. Listen, he's waiting just for you to posture yourself to be, you can't grow until you're honest. You can't, you cannot grow until you get honest. And I want to camp here for just a moment because for some of you, this, this intimacy with God, this being honest and open with God is, is going to open up the door to, to intimacy in every other area of your life. And this is actually why you're having a hard time being intimate with your spouse or opening up to your kids or opening up in friendships because you're not even open to God. And, and you can be married for 50 years and never have intimacy. And some of you know, you know you're hiding things from your wife. You're hiding things from your husband. You're just, you have some things. And how you cannot have intimacy if you're not open and honest. And it starts with saying, okay, I need to be honest with myself. And God, I need to be honest with you. And I promise you, if you do that, you start being honest with God, you will go to a whole other level of intimacy with him. It's the third direction, right? You've got to look in. Holy Spirit, search me. Here's the fourth direction after we do that. Now I've got to look around and ask Jesus to use me. We have to look around and ask Jesus to use me. This is, for a lot of us, um, instead of, listen, instead of criticizing and complaining and whining and, and moaning, uh, why don't you just say, Jesus, show me what's wrong, but don't stop there. A lot of you know what's wrong with the world and with politics and with government and our country and people and, and your job. And you know what's wrong, but don't stop there. Say, Jesus, show me what's wrong, and then show me how you want to use me to make a difference in it. That's, that's, that's the fourth direction of your prayer. It's not just all about criticizing and complaining. It's getting to a point where you say, God, help me to make a difference in the midst of it. The two most dangerous words that you can pray, and I dare you to pray, use me. 
I dare you to say that to God. I dare you to just get, God, use me. Romans 6, 13 says, give yourself completely to God. Like, stop going halfway in. Stop treating him as your Sunday God. Stop just sharing parts of your heart and your life with him. Go all in. Give your heart completely to God. Every part of you, since you've been given a new life, and you want to be used as a tool in the hands of God, used for his good purpose. That's what we want. I think it's inside of every person who wants to make a difference. They want their life to count. And check it out, you guys. If, you're, if you've never had that experience where you've been used by God to make a difference, then, then I pity you, man, because this is honestly what, di- what discovery is all about. It's not only helping you discover who God is, but who you are in Christ and what he's called you to do. And a lot of what we do around here is to help you get to that place of revelation of what God has called you to do, to get to that place where you say, man, I'm in my niche. I'm doing what God has called me to do. Man, I was made for this. I'm doing what God has made me for. And I don't know who I'm talking to today, but there are some of you here today that the world, listen, the world is waiting for your contribution. I don't know what it is inside of you and what gift what, what is stored up, but listen to me, the world is waiting for your contribution, for you to posture yourself and not just, not just criticize and complain, but take it a step further and say, God, not only show me what's wrong, but show me what I can do about it. How can you use me, God, to make a difference in this world? So, so stop trying to do something great. Stop trying to do something great for God and just do normal things with a great amount of love, and I promise you, God will bless that. Amen, somebody? Stop trying to find some significant place to serve. Just make whatever you're doing significant by pouring your whole heart into it, and I promise you, God will take notice. That's the fourth direction. It it needs to move to God around me. Jesus, how do you want to use me to make a difference in the world? That's the right posture. And here's here's the fifth direction that we need to look to, and that is we look to the future with faith. We look to the future with faith. I don't know if you've ever invited God into your future. If you've ever got to a place where, where you know, you invited God into your dreams and into your plans and into your goals. That's one of the questions I love asking people. Like, what is God's dream for your life? What do you, if you could do anything for God, anything at all, and you know you couldn't fail, money was no object, what would you do? If, you, if you've ever thought about including God in your future, including God in your dream and allowing Him to script something beautiful. It's the the fifth direction. Now as I'm looking to my future, I'm going to include God in that. And some of you are probably thinking right now, no, He'll mess it up. No, I promise you He won't. I promise you the best parts of my life are the God-scripted moments. It's the vision that God gave me in moments of prayer in moments of vision and revelation where I say, God, what do you want to do? Where are we going? Where are you taking my family? Where are you taking my calling? Where are you taking discovery? Those are the best parts of life when you invite God into your future. Philippians 1, 6 says, I am confident of this, that God who began a good work in you, he started something, he's going to continue to complete it until it's finished on the day of Christ's return. Um, he'll complete it. You know why? Because God doesn't sponsor flops. He only sponsors blockbusters. Amen, you guys? Amen. Let me pray for you. Go ahead and bow your heads all across this room. Some of you here today.